Good evening, my name is Melissa Sorolla. I'm CBS Energy's Vice President of Corporate Communications and Marketing. O prima estrella cero a hora para escuchar en español. Thank you for joining us this evening for this interactive town hall, where we're gonna provide you information about how we need to power our community in the future and get your feedback. This is a great opportunity for us to speak to you directly and answer your questions and listen to your comments. On our panel today, we have Benny Etheridge, who is our Executive Vice President of Energy Supply, Corey Kuczynski, our Chief Financial Officer, and Angela Rodriguez, our Director of Climate Strategy and Sustainability. For those of you who are joining us on your cell phone, you can text STAR8 to receive the streaming video link, or you can also watch this event at, on our website by going to cpsenergy.com forward slash watch live or on our Facebook page. If you have a question, you can press star three on your phone keypad at any time, and you'll be placed in line to speak with a member of our team. We're gonna to try to get to as many questions as we can. So once you press star three, you'll be placed in line, and the next time you hear your name, you'll be live on the call, and you'll be able to ask your question directly. If you are participating on the live stream, you can enter your name and questions below the streaming player, or if you're on Facebook, simply leave a comment. We hope you join the discussion and we have a lot of ground to cover, so we're gonna get started. And for those of, us, of you who are just joining us, this is an interactive forum and we would love to hear from you. We'll be taking as many questions from participants as we possibly can. And again, as a reminder, dial star three to answer a question. O prima estrella cero ahora para escuchar en español. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, as you know, San Antonio is one of the fastest growing cities in the country and we continue to have increasing energy and infrastructure needs. The goal of this power generation planning process that we're going, uh, going through right now is to make sure we have enough supply to meet the needs of our customers between now and 2030. Our city continues to grow and we have power plants that are reaching their end of life. We have to plan for these changes while maintaining our commitment to supply reliable, resilient, affordable, and sustainable energy for our customers 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. You're going to hear us talk a lot about how we power our community, and in particular, uh, we're going to talk about solar, wind, nuclear, gas, coal. These are all different forms of power generation that we utilize to power the homes and businesses uh, throughout the city and the surrounding areas. There are benefits and challenges with, with each of these resources, which is why we will continue to work to prioritize our objectives. We also have a commitment to, uh, to support the city's climate action and adaptation plan, and Angela is going to speak to that later in our program. It's because of these, this backdrop and these considerations that we've been working with our rate advisory committee to identify and examine the types of power generation resources to be added over the next several years. The, RAC, the rate advisor committee is going to make a recommendation to our board in December on which technologies they believe will provide the best value to our community. Our team will also make a recommendation and it is our board that will ultimately make a decision on how to power our future. As I mentioned earlier, this planning period takes us to 2030 and considers aging power plants, the future of coal powered units and the projected population growth expected for greater San, greater San Antonio, which will demand 115 megawatts of additional power every single year. And just to put that into context, 115 megawatts is equivalent to powering 23,000 homes. I'm first gonna turn it over to Benny Etheridge. Uh, Benny, I talked a little bit about our, our resources and how we make power and want you to go a little bit more in depth for, the, for everyone on the call. Well, thank you, Melissa, and good evening, folks. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. CPS Energy, over the years, has, has built a diversified generation fleet of over 7,000 megawatts of capacity. We've done that through a combination of ownership, partnership, and power purchase agreements so that we can provide the best, lowest price, if you will, for renewable energy. When you look at our fleet today, Almost 50% is powered by natural gas. We have three different technologies in play. Traditional gas steam units, combined cycle, and gas turbine peaking units. We also have almost 20% of our, our fleet composed of coal units today. That would be the spruce plants uh, many of you are familiar with. And then of course, we've got about 14% nuclear, our share of the South Texas project. We also have about 21% of our capacity coming from renewables today. So. We've built a diversified fleet to help us protect you all, our customers, from fuel risk and equipment risk. 
as we look forward, we, we know that the spruce coal plants, because they burn coal, have higher emissions. And, and that's something we're working through today. And so as we move forward and talk about our climate, adapt, <clears throat> excuse me, our climate action and adaptation plan, uh, we have to make changes and we know that and we're working on that today. Uh, Angela is going to talk a little bit more about that uh, here shortly. Melissa, I think that's a good overview of our fleet. Great, Benny. We're going to go to the first caller, see um, who the name is there for the first caller. And our first uh, caller is Judy. So Judy, if you can hear us, you'll be placed in line next to, to ask your question. Judy? Yes. Yeah. All right, ma'am. Well, thank you for joining us. You're on the line. We'd love to hear your question. Okay, this was in regards to something I heard on the news that on our December bill, we were going to get a break because of what happened in February when we didn't have power. And by getting a break, I assumed that my bill would be less. Instead, it was more than $45 more than it normally is, and I'm on the budget plan. So can you explain that? Uh, Judy, what you're referring to is a city credit that was given back to our customers because of high heat and high energy demand this um, this summer. And customers are going to see that starting in, in this month's bill. But if you can hold the line, Judy, we're going to take um, your information and we're going to connect you with one of our customer, our energy advisors um, here later on down the line so we can help answer your questions. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate well, it. Thank you for joining us. If you're just joining us, Benny Etheridge, our Executive VP of Energy, Energy Supply, was giving us an overview of how we currently produce power. To further ex explain um, our current uh, power generation, we're going to play a short video. So if you're listening through the phone, don't worry, it's going to be narrated and you'll be able to, to listen to that. However, if you'd like to, to watch and you're joining us on your cell phone, you can text star eight to receive the streaming video link, or you can also watch it on our uh, Facebook page or on our website. And as soon as we're done with that video, we're gonna go to the next question. So let's queue up the video first and it'll give you a little bit more explanation of how we power our community. San Antonio is the fastest growing city in the nation. And as our city continues to grow, CPS Energy is working to make sure we can deliver on our core mission of providing reliable, competitively priced, and sustainable energy services in an equitable manner. An additional 115 megawatts, enough to power about 23,000 additional homes or some combination of homes and businesses, will be needed each year to keep up with the growth. Today, when you flip the light switch, plug in a computer, or enjoy family movie night, the power behind the wall is coming from one of four main sources, natural gas, coal, nuclear, and renewables, which are solar, wind, and landfill gas energy. Natural gas power is our largest energy source, producing fewer emissions than coal plants. Coal-fired power uses well-established emission control technologies, but produces greater emissions than natural gas plants. Our current system includes aging gas units that could be replaced by 2030. Coal units are also being considered for retirement or to be repurposed to operate using natural gas instead of coal. Operating with natural gas will reduce emissions and allow a unit to stay in operation longer for resiliency purposes. Another power source is nuclear power, which has zero emissions and is extremely reliable. Wind and solar power are zero emission renewable resources, but as you can imagine, if the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, they don't produce much. Renewables work best when backed by storage technologies. Current storage technologies typically last a few hours. Now that you know more, we want to hear from you about how we should power our community going forward. Take our survey and get more information at cpsenergy.com slash path forward. All right, well, thank you. We hope you all enjoyed that. Again, that video is on our uh, website. Uh, we hope you check that out, uh, cpsenergy.com forward slash path forward. We are going to go to another live caller and Russell Seal, 
you'll be next uh, live to ask your question. Russell, can you hear us? Hello, All right, can well, you hear me? Yes. Hi, Russell. Thanks for being on. Yes, I was at the uh, event for the open house, uh, I guess a, a week or so ago, and I was very interested in converting, uh, shutting down Spruce 1 coal plant and, and converting only Spruce 2 because Spruce 1 doesn't have the $200 million SCRs on it. And I was asking about, and they were telling me that's just going to be a steam unit and not a combined cycle natural gas plant, which some of our other modern gas plants are. And has this been modeled uh, to convert it to a combined cycle plant? And if not, it would it be better to get a combined cycle plant from another source completely? And that's my question. Russell, we missed the last part of your question. Can you ask that again? Have we? A, my main question is: Have we modeled uh, converting it to a combined cycle instead of a steam? And have we considered just getting it, if it's too expensive to do that, just getting it from a different combined cycle natural gas plant instead of utilizing that as a steam plant? Considering how much more energy efficient and how much less emissions a combined cycle plant has. Thanks, Russell. And thanks for joining us at our open house last week. We, we appreciate that. Um, Benny, we're going to turn to you for uh, to answer that question. Great. Thank you, Russell. And I appreciate the question. So we, we've looked at spruce as a gas conversion. It The structure of the unit, uh, the design of the unit is not such that we could convert it to a natural uh, combined cycle unit. Uh, we do have the ability to convert it to natural gas. And the, the benefit there is that unit was commissioned in 2010. So we have a significant investment in the unit. And by converting to natural gas, we'll be able to realize most of the value, the investment in that unit for years to come at a significantly lower price than if we purchased a, a new combined cycle plant, for example. So that's the logic. Uh, behind the, the thoughts to repower. I'll, I'll tell you that as we, we work through the process of looking at different portfolios with the Rate Advisory Committee, uh, there were options that had that gas conversion, there were options that did not. And so we, we have worked through that analysis. Uh, at the end of the day, it'll ultimately, ultimately be our board's decision what we're going to do with that unit, but we, we've looked at it a, a couple of different ways. Uh, thanks again, Russell. We're going to go ahead and take another live caller. Uh, Don has a question that's a little related to the video we just uh, showed. So if we could put Don live into the queue. Hello, I'm here. Hi, Don. You're live. You can ask your Hi. question. Yes, uh, I'm, I might have missed that because I was talking to the operator when uh, when that uh, video was playing. But I was curious, as you mentioned at the outset about aging systems, and I'm wondering if the aging systems you're talking about are also all the coal-fired or also are, are some of the renewables also in that group? No, sir. Um, the, the renewables are still relatively early in their life. The, uh, the aging units we're talking about uh, the Bronick units, we've been working through an evaluation of their retirement, and that was, you may recall, when we initiated the Flex Power Bundle to replace that capacity. Well, we have another mm -hmm. approximately 2,000 megawatts of generation capacity we need that will result as we retire some of the remaining gas steam units that are aging out and also address the, the growth our community is experiencing. As, as you heard Melissa mention at the beginning of this discussion, we're seeing about 115 megawatts a year of capacity increase as more and right. more people move to our city. And of course, we're seeing more electrical vehicle use. So bottom line is our demand is going up and we, we need some additional generation to help us meet the needs of the community. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And as our previous caller, Russell, mentioned an open house that we've been ha that we had a couple of weeks or last week, actually. And we want to hear from you about how we should power our communities 
future. So later on, we'll talk to you about how we can uh, get your input through a survey. Um, and there's other ways you can get involved as well. We do have public input every month at our Board of Trustees meeting and our Rate Advisory Committee meetings too. Our next Rate Advisory Committee meeting is on December 15th and our next board meeting is December 19th. So Benny, as I mentioned, the Rate Advisory Committee, uh, this has been a process that's been going on since last year. So talk to us a little bit about that process, how we're getting there, um, how we're educating them uh, to give a recommendation to our Board of Trustees. Well, I'll, I'll do that, Melissa. I'll tell you, we, we started this process with the Rate Advisory Committee back in April of last year. And I cannot tell you how appreciative I am, I, we are, for the, the contributions that the 20 people on the committee and, and the leader, uh, Reed Williams, have made to help us move forward. They, they have done so much work. They've invested so much time since we kicked things off to learn about generation, to learn about our system, existing technology, new technology, and also help us learn their insights better see things from their perspective and such. So it, it's been a learning opportunity for, for us and them. Uh, we, we've been very busy. We, we've worked through a, a standard planning process, a generation planning process. We, we brought in two highly regarded consultants that assist utilities across the country in their rate planning process. And together, we, we've developed uh, the uh, objectives that we wanted to accomplish coming forward and selecting new generation. We've identified market scenarios or market conditions is what those are. You know, will the market, the energy market, the financial market stay the same way it is today or, or will it change? Will we see a, a shift towards uh, zero emissions? Will we see a shift towards increased carbon like people are experiencing in Europe, for example? You know, what will those scenarios be or what could they be? And then together we identified nine portfolios. That was a, a collection of resources that were composed of a combination of renewable and thermal uh, fossil and, and storage in an effort to meet the needs of our community. We also included uh, community purchases, energy purchases from the ERCOT market as needed. So we, we came up with a, a lot, of, lot of portfolios to give us a really good view of opportunities, options we have out there. Then we work through a modeling process. That's been completed, the analysis has been done, the uh, information has been delivered to our RAC, and they're studying it now, and, and we're preparing to let them work through a process where, where they can make a recommendation to our board here at the end of this year. So we, we've gone through the, the full gamut of our generation planning process this year, and the difference is, We've invited the community to participate. That's not something we've done historically, and that's not something you typically see in the country, but it, it is a trend because our community cares deeply about what we do here, and we know that. And I gotta tell you, uh, my hat's off to this team again for the help they've given us, and look forward to uh, hearing their recommendation here shortly. Thank you, Benny. And I know it's been a very information filled year and we're glad you all are on the line with us. And just as a reminder, if you do want to ask us a question, you can press star three to be placed in queue. We're going to take an online question next. And this one comes from a person named Teji Kano. And the question is, can the STP nuclear power plant be expanded? So Benny, this one goes back to you. Okay, well, thank you, Melissa, and, and thank you, Becky, for the question. Uh, yes, the, the STP project could be expanded. Uh, we own that project in partnership with the City of Austin and NRG, and uh, together we could decide that it makes sense for us to do more down there. I, I know things have been evaluated in the past, and, and we will continue to do that going forward. It's a, it's a large site with, with a lot of resources. So, uh, Yes, yes, ma'am. It, it could definitely be expanded, and that's something that is on the table for future consideration. Thanks, Benny. We're going to give you a little bit of a break because we're going to go to Corey Kaczynski next, our chief financial officer. Uh, Corey, of course, financial decisions will have to be made after our board decides on our path forward. Talk to us about how your team has been involved in this generation planning process and how they will be involved when a decision is made. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Melissa. And uh, good evening, everybody. So Benny did a really good job teeing up the exercise that we've been doing for the last several months um, and the kind of extensive modeling and uh, efforts that we've been uh, been doing. As part of the objectives that we are working towards and evaluating, you know, affordability is one of those objectives. And so you know, with that in mind, um, it, it's not always necessarily about the, you know, cheapest option, but really what balances all the other non-financial objectives with a balance of affordability. And in the multiple scenarios that uh, Benny has uh, and worked through with their team, there are interesting kind of uh, uh, trade-offs between the different portfolios. And some of the elements that we are looking at and discussing with the Ray Advisory Committee are um, how certain portfolios respond in uh, a certain expected type of future, whether it be weather or market conditions, um, how, how one of those portfolios performs. Uh, and how that contrasts to uh, how a certain portfolio may perform in an extreme weather condition that we've had, you know, whether, you know, super hot or super cold. And what's interesting is, you know, there are nuances and differences between all of those portfolios. Um, some of those, again, we've talked about at the Ray Advisory Committee, and we will talk about again at our board. All of that is about um, taking it in balance. And what we'll ultimately do after our board makes a decision uh, on kind of the direction we want to go in is we will start to build that into our, our forecast. And just to tie it back to the conversations we had a year ago with the community, one of the outcomes of the last rate increase that we had said was we were going to spend this year doing just what we're doing, um, evaluating future generation options. And then as part of our next rate increase will be um, to take whatever comes out of this discussion, community discussion, and that'll be an element of, of our future rate requests. So it's all connected to the same storyline that we began about a year ago, and Benny seems just driving that forward, and we'll kind of continue that discussion, you know, uh, as we go into next year. Thanks, Corey, um, and thank you both for, for pro providing that input. And again, if you're just joining us, you're with CPS Energy, and we're talking about plans to power our community's future, and we wanna hear from you. We do have a survey and the team will uh, pop up a QR code that you will be able to go to, to tell us what you think. Uh, we wanna hear about what your objectives are and how you think we should power our community's future. So we'll give that a few minutes. Uh, we also wanna remind everybody, especially if you're listening on the phone only, that you can go to our website, cpsenergy.com forward slash path forward, and you can find that survey at the bottom of the page. We've already had close to a thousand people give us their input. And just as a reminder, that survey closes tomorrow. So we'll wait a minute while that um, survey goes up, that uh, pops up. And in the meantime too, we'll go to a live caller. We have Ian who's patiently been waiting on the line. Uh, so if we can have Ian go live so he can ask his live question. Hi, how's everybody doing? Great, thanks for joining us, Ian. Thank you for having me. So my question is kind of a two-parter. Uh, one was with the evidence last year from the winter storm that hit San Antonio, a lot of San Antonians were without power for an extended period of time. So I know that um, it was mentioned that rate increases were coming. So what is going to be put towards ensuring that what occurred during the winter storm doesn't happen again? And then I know you mentioned a partnership with Reliant on one of your, oh, with energy, not Reliant, I apologize, uh, on one of the energy power plants. Um, what are the possibilities of, you know, working with more companies to help lower the cost of electricity here in San Antonio? Because a lot of San Antonians are also feeling the pinch in the pocketbook as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And we're gonna to go to Benny and Corey who are gonna tag team the response for this question. So Benny, we'll go to you first. Okay, thank you. So as we, uh, as we look at the program we initiated for weatherization, we, uh, we have invested significant dollars in improving the, the weatherization in our plants beyond just our normal seasonal winter preparation. And we've done this to make sure that our plants will be good to go if we experience something a little bit worse than winter storm URI. As you probably have heard, the Public Utility Commission issued guidelines for weatherization standards. And we've put 
uh, improvements in place in our facilities to meet those standards. We've also seen that the Railroad Commission has done a similar thing with the gas system. And we're told that the people that we buy gas from have completed their activities as well. So we believe that the, the investments we've already made have put us in, a, in an exceptionally good position moving forward. Corey, yeah, what would you like to add? Yeah, I'll add to that a little bit. So again, just to connect the dots to, to our last rate request, um, part of the conversation we had with community you know, back in this winter that we just passed was about the previous winter, Winter Storm Mary. So when Benny talked about you know, improvements to weatherizing our plants, some of our existing dollars and part of the, the budget that was approved for this year and this rate increase that we have now went into that. And to Benny's point, there's still probably more to come and more support um, you know, that'll be, be coming down. And we'll work that into our forecast, but we think we already got a good you know, placeholders for that for now. Um, some of the other changes just to be aware of is in the winter storm area, there, there's two elements, right? There's um, the local equipment that we have in this city and how we um, you know, shed load. And we made a lot of improvements. Um, and the really that's important is it's really ERCOT that tells us, CPS, how much um, you know, load we had to drop. And so the improvements we made were to increase the number of um, circuits that we could take offline for lack of better words so that we could rotate people more frequently and so what we've done in that regard is adjust our system in a manner uh, that allows us to not have folks out for days maybe you know out for a much much shorter periods of time but rotated evenly throughout the city that was enabled by um you know investments in reclosers that we had in our last rate request that was 10 million dollars of, of that so there's actually been a significant amount of funds already kind of baked into our budget and into our rate a rate increase, a previous one, um, to, to help harden our system and, uh, you know, generating systems and locally. So to the extent that there's going to be any more investment that we'll need rate support for, it'll be transparent and it'll be part of the conversation. We'll break it out just like we did last year for the last rate increase that we did. Um, and, you know, it'll be part of the discussion then. And you could expect us to have a similar town hall like we're having tonight to make sure that we get your comments and questions and make sure you have the information you need, um, the information you need going forward. So we do thank you all for your calls. Remember, if you have a question, you can press star three on your keypad at any time. You can also post a question in the Facebook chat and we'll work to get it answered. We're now going to continue with Angela Rodriguez. Angela is our Director of Climate Strategy and Sustainability at CPS Energy. Angela, tell us more about your work with the city and in particular, the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. Thank you, Melissa, and good evening, everybody. Um, the city's Climate Action and Adaptation Plan was adopted in 2019 and it has an overall goal of reaching carbon neutrality as a community by 2050. In addition to that 2050 goal, there's also um, some interim targets, one for 2030 and one for 2040. And under our current plan, we could meet those interim targets by adding more renewables and shutting down our Spruce One coal unit. Uh, but to get to that 2050 net zero goal, most of our fossil fuel units, meaning our gas and coal powered units will need to be shut down or potentially fitted with some type of carbon capture technology if that's even possible or feasible. In addition to that, we're always looking at new technologies and innovations like hydrogen, geothermal, and as these reach um, utility scale deployment, we'll be able to add those again to get to that net zero goal by 2050. Um, another piece of the climate action and adaptation plan uh, that we've kind of heard a little bit about from callers already is uh, extreme weather events and adapting and making our community more resilient um, as we have more and more of those extreme weather events. And so part of the resource planning and the work that Benny's team is doing is also looking how different options um, how they maintain reliability and resiliency during those weather events. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Angela. Uh, we're gonna take a couple of online questions next. So the first one comes from Guadalupe Saldana and their question is, can we get more energy from neighboring states? So Benny, this is a great time to explain our relationship and how we fit into uh, the ERCOT uh, market. So if you can, can answer that question for, for Guadalupe. 
That is a great question. Appreciate the opportunity. What I can tell you is that ERCOT is a standalone market and it is not interconnected with the adjacent states. We, we do have some DC connections, but that's really not suitable for moving large volumes of power like you see in other states. Er, ERCOT has continued to maintain uh, resiliency here in Texas and Texas alone. And uh, that, that's not something we see changing at this point anyway. Thanks, Benny. I think this this next one can go to you as well, and, and maybe actually Angela and Corey as well. We have another online question from Doug Rappel, and Doug's question is, how has the Inflation Re Reduction Act passed in August impacted planning for our future power generation needs? So we're really excited about the Inflation Reduction Act. There, The first thing it did that it made it possible for us to actually own renewable generation and take advantage of production and investment tax credits. Historically, we've not been able to do that, and we've needed to contract with others that have tax liabilities to take advantage of those at some cost to us. So this is a great opportunity to let us take an ownership position with renewable energy. We're looking forward to that, and we're already starting to evaluate opportunities. There are also additional grant funds that are available for different types of projects that we are evaluating now. We're, we're seeing some opportunities to, to get matching funds to do pilot projects for storage. Uh, geothermal is out there. It's something we're, we're starting to evaluate now. And uh, we, we think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities going forward as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. So we're very excited about it and we're glad to see it. And we, we look forward to uh, using it uh, for, the, for the good of our community. Thanks, Benny. I know there's a lot more to come there and we'll be sure to keep um, our customers, our community updated on that. We're gonna go to another live caller. I believe it's Rudy on the line that we have. Rudy? Yeah, I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes. You're, you're live, Rudy. Hey. You can ask your question. Hey, thanks for taking my question. So I'm just curious a little bit about the, the sourcing of the natural gas. It sounded like you guys were going to be converting some of our coal plants to natural gas. And if that's correct, I'm curious on the source of that natural gas. I know Texas has been a pretty good uh, producer of gas for a couple of decades. And I'm just curious why now? So good question. Let me take that one. What, what we're doing is looking at converting uh, spruce two to natural gas. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're doing that because it's a relatively new plant. We've got a significant investment in it and we can continue to use a large portion of that investment if we do a gas conversion. Ultimately, our board will make that decision here later this year. Uh, the, the gas we buy here is, is sourced within Texas. Uh, there, there's Typically, we buy from the east side and the west side, I think. But in, in terms of the companies we deal with, there's probably 25 companies out there that we contract with to secure our gas here in Texas. Now, does that answer your question? It does. It just ultimately, I just really want to understand, you know, are we making this decision from a fiscal opportunity to make this uh, less expensive or are we making it more from an uh, environmental decision? just to get closer to carbon net zero? And if so, is it better for us to, you know, I don't know, take it to a vote and decide, well, instead of it, instead of investing the money in the conversion to natural gas, can we just save the money and get into, get into another larger investment down the road? I'm just curious on, from a fiscal perspective, or maybe it's more on the... Okay, um, so, uh, our, our city ha has launched the, the CAP initiative. You've, you've heard Angela speak to that, uh, Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, and we've committed to reducing our emissions incrementally 2030, 2040, and then by 2050 being net zero carbon. And, and we're committed to that. Our, our board has determined that is the path forward for us, and, and we're going to accomplish that. We see the gas conversion okay. of spruce as a way to continue to get significant value out of that large investment we made for the community and still achieve our, our goals here of reaching carbon neutrality. I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Rudy. Uh, we had an, another online question from Elisa. 
and who asked what will happen with our input from taking the survey? I mentioned the survey a little bit earlier and we have been working to get as much information out to our community on our next steps. And please, you know, rest assured everything that we're um, gathering from our community, we are going to um, submit to our, our board of trustees to help them in their decision making process. So we do encourage everybody to take that survey that is uh, located on our, our on our website. Uh, we do have another question, a live call, oh, an online caller, sorry, an online question um, from a Robert that we'll go to. And Robert asks, there are, are some exciting zero CO2 wind emission generation in the Atlantic Ocean. Are you looking at them? And what are your plans with regard to wind energy and zero emissions? Okay, I think I can take that. As part of our portfolio development process, we, we have integrated wind also in that process. Some portfolios use more wind than others, but we are definitely continuing to use wind as we go forward. I have not looked at a specific project in the Atlantic, but I, I will tell you, and I, I guess this is probably a, a good point to make, so I appreciate you bringing it up. Today, we're limited to the technology that we can put in place and will work right now. Because before 2030, we have to replace this generation. It, it's aging out. And without replacement generation, we're, we're, we have some challenges. We've got to get it in place. We're starting to look at the same time forward for emerging technology. You heard Angela mention geothermal energy. Uh, we've talked about small modular nuclear. We've talked about hydrogen storage as a way to uh, actually take excess electricity created during the day and convert hydrogen and then store the hydrogen and then use it on demand later in off-peak periods. So there's a lot of things we're looking at. We're engaging with many, many people and the IRA has actually uh, accelerated that process because there's more companies out there seeking to take advantage of those opportunities and push their concepts forward. So we're moving forward. We're looking at a lot of new generation technology and, and storage technology, frankly, the longer duration storage uh, to serve our community. But for now, we, we've got to deal with what we can get in the market. And we know works right now to get us going for 2030. Does that answer your question? Well, that was an online question, but Benny, don't want you to forget too. Right, we're number one uh, in wind in in Texas, so let's let's tout that while we can as well. You so, just right. as a reminder, uh, if you are joining us by phone and like to ask a question, please press star three to be placed in the queue. Uh, we have another online question, and and I Benny, get ready because this is another one coming to you. Uh, it came from a Richard and it was online and it, Richard asked recently the UT UT figured out a way to power by fuel cells. Oh, I'm sorry. This Richard's actually live. So we'll go to Richard live on the, on the phone. Richard, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right. I didn't want to steal your thunder there to ask, ask your question. So go ahead, Richard. Uh, within the last six months, I read an article about the University of Texas, uh, they have a patent now on separating hydrogen. Uh, Richard, you're breaking up a little bit. Can you try again? All right, well, some of the insight that Richard gave to the folks um, on the phone was asking about if there's a way to power by fuel cells and if, if we're looking into that. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that, uh, Benny. I will do that. Thank you for the question, Richard. Uh, right now, we are not looking at fuel cells specifically, uh, but if there is a commercial offering out there, then we will absolutely look at it. In, in my experience, fuel cells tend to be small in output capacity, making them probably better suited for resiliency uh, uses and such as a as opposed to large generation that, that we typically provide. But we we are literally focused on an all-in assessment of the technology that's available in the market to meet the needs of our community. We know that distributed resources will continue to grow and we're prepared to support that and be part of that solution for the community. 
So yes, to answer your question, if it's a if it's a commercial technology out there, we we will definitely look at it and seek opportunities to integrate it to the extent it makes good financial sense for for our customers. Great. Now this time we will go to an online question uh, that from Ken who asks if there are plans for large battery banks like Victoria Australia. So that is a great question. And, and uh, yes, sir, I can tell you that we are evaluating a couple of projects now for large batteries. I, I can also tell you that I had a call earlier this week with a, a company that does flow batteries and they have opportunities for large scale, uh, longer duration batteries. So we're, we're all, again, all in on storage technology and we're looking at everything out there. Today, we know we can get our hands on battery storage, lithium ion batteries, and, and we are moving forward, as I said, with a, a couple of projects. All right, but I'm not gonna let you off the hook because I think this is a good time also to remind everybody about what the next steps are in this process with our rate advisory committee and with our board. So if you can go over uh, for everybody the timeline and we still have some time to take some more questions, but why don't you go ahead and, and outline the, the next steps and what's gonna happen over the next couple of weeks? Well, thank you, Melissa. And, and that is a good point because that's central to us moving forward. We, we've we worked through the process. In fact, you, you can see it on the screen there. We're, we're on the far right now. Select the preferred plan. Our rate advisory committee is doing their review now and we expect to hear from them very shortly on which portfolio choice they prefer and, and why they prefer it. And they will, of course, share that with our, our board here later this month and uh, we've got input from other groups as well that are, are sharing with us uh, this survey that Melissa has asked you several times to participate in. I hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, we, we've been using it for a little while now, and I, I think it's a great way to get community at large input. Uh, we, we've held town halls and such, and again, we've gotten input there. So we've cast as broad as a net as we can to, to get community input. Once our board has all of this information, they will review it, they will ask questions, they will uh, perhaps ask us to do additional research, we will provide information with them, and then our board will make a decision around year end, uh, by, by the first quarter of next year at any rate. And they will tell us what we should do to, to meet the needs of our community and our, our team is prepared to get started. Uh, we, uh, we, we have a, a group pulled together and we've got members from each area of, of our business and we're, uh, we're, we're ready to go. We've, we've already started looking at assessments for a couple of the, the leading portfolios uh, so that we're going to be ready to roll. But uh, early next year, we expect to uh, be firming up plans and, and getting started. Thanks, Benny. And, and again, we have a couple of public uh, meetings coming up. We have the Rate Advisory Committee meeting, which is on Thursday, December 15th at 3. And our next board meeting is on Monday, December 19th at 1. Public open is open at the beginning of both of these, of both of these meetings. Uh, we're going to go to a live caller next. We're going to go to Peggy. Peggy, you'll be next online uh, to ask your question. Yes, thanks for taking my call. Um, my question relates to something we were talking about maybe five minutes ago, but I'm really curious, when you purchase your natural gas for firing the energy plants, do you all have some sort of rule that you would refuse to purchase gas from companies that are actively venting and or flaring at well and storage sites? And I'm, I'm concerned about this because a couple of weeks ago, on the news hour, there was a segment about how horrible the Permian Basin, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Eagle Ford does not follow the same pattern, of just open vents of methane and whatever else coming out of these well sites and the storage tanks. So that, you know, you can talk about how you're reducing our carbon footprint, but if we're purchasing gas from these companies that just really don't seem to think there's any kind of issue there. It's a problem, and it's a problem for us because we're buying from companies that have no regard for atmospheric problems that they're creating. Thanks. 
Okay. Um, well, Melissa, if it's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that one. Please so we, we purchase gas from a variety of suppliers in the market and, and typically they're, they're mid market people as opposed to producers. And, and so what they do is buy gas at the wellhead, for example, they, they operate and maintain pipelines and they process gas and, and they sell it to people like us. So we don't necessarily have line of sight on companies, uh, the, the actual producer and, and how they conduct their business. I, I will tell you that I, I know that many of them use candlestick flares and the, the candlestick flare is designed to consume all of the methane uh, that is released in the atmosphere. I, I can't speak to things that some of them are not doing because I, I just don't have any knowledge of it. But we tend to buy from the middle market people and so we wouldn't have a, a good way to even screen for that uh, condition. Thanks, Benny. We're going to go to another online question. Uh, Diane has asked, when will Spruce 2 be decommissioned? So that's a really good question. And that decision is in the hands of our board. I can tell you that we've identified portfolios, uh, options that would convert it to natural gas that would shut it down. And so all of those things are on the table for our board to consider. And again, they'll be taking recommendations from our rate advisory committee and others here shortly, and they'll complete their assessment and they'll decide what we should do. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't give you a date because we just don't know which direction we're going to go right now. Yeah, we're process underway and, and we know it's been a informative and, and long question. Um, we do have a question uh, for, um, I was going to say Angela, I was going to throw her one, but we'll keep going here. Uh, as a reminder, if you're on the phone and you'd like to ask us a question, please press star three and we can put you live in the, in the queue. Uh, we are also taking online questions and we're taking questions from Facebook. And we've mentioned a couple of times that we want to encourage you to uh, give us your feedback and uh, participate in the survey that we have on our website, cpsenergy.com forward slash uh, path forward. Uh, we have a question online from uh, Mr. Tom Corser. Uh, Tom, thanks for submitting your question to us. Uh, Mr. Corser's question is, this is an important dialogue given we have some critical investment decisions, but can we look forward to future foreign forums for generation options and investments? I can take part of that and then Benny um, and anybody else want to chime in there, but we have worked um, extremely hard over these last couple of years to uh, focus on transparency and have conversations like this with you. And while sometimes it can be pretty complex. Uh, we are making a really concerted effort to simplify and be out in the public uh, and talking to customers one on one about the things that we have to do. So you do have our commitment that will continue forums like this in person dialogue, uh, direct uh, messaging to our customers um, through um, direct mail and, and things like that, uh, so that you're as in informed as you can be. So thank you, Mr. Corsa, for that for that question. And uh, we, of course, look forward to continue dialogue with our with our customers. And again, uh, just as a reminder, everybody, start three. Uh, we're, we're here to take your calls for um, at least five or six more minutes. So we'll give the team a, a couple of minutes to um, to to go through some of the questions um, that we that we've received so far. Uh, I would be remiss to not um, say that if, if you or if you know somebody that needs um, bill assistance or any questions about your um, service, please don't hesitate to, to visit us on our website and um, also or call one of our, our um, energy advisors. Uh, we're here to help you. Um, we're here to help, of course. Uh, we have another question from Tejicano online. And that question is, is CPS Energy employing coal washing along with electrostatic precipitators and fabric filters at its cold fired plants? And I think Angela, you may have some insight to that as well. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, at our power plants, we do burn um, or utilize low sulfur coal 
So just starting from the type of coal we're utilizing, with it's lower in emissions than other types of coals. In addition to that, instead of electrostatic precipitators to help um, collect some of the particulate matter, we use what you mentioned there, fabric filters or bag house systems, which uh, collect about 99% of the particulate matter that is produced at coal units. We also have a lot of um, air emission controls for um, other constituents on our gas-fired units, also on our coal-fired units. So that was a great question. Thanks, Angelina. That's that's pretty technical, <laughs> but we thanks for uh, you trying to break it down for us um, as much as you can. And we're going to wait. Just uh, we're going to go through some other questions here to see uh, what comes in. And as a reminder, um, star three uh, to ask a question live. And of course, we're looking um, through your questions that you're that you're asking. I'm online and through uh, Facebook uh, for our team. And we are gonna go to uh, Maria, who is next live on the phone. Maria? Yes. You can, you're live, ma'am. You can ask your question. Okay, I wanted to know if you're going to need other countries to help when we don't have enough gas. I believe I heard the question was, if we were going to need other countries, if we didn't have enough gas. So, Benny, uh, maybe you can speak to that. And then, Corey, too, I know there's, you know, when we're talking about gas and we're talking about other countries and related to even high gas, natural gas pricing. Maybe that's something you can share with everyone, Corey, as well as something we saw through the summer and anticipate we're gonna see through the winter too. So Benny, I'll let you talk about the first part. Okay, thank you. And hey, that, that's a very good question. So uh, here, here in our country, we have very large natural gas deposits and those are producing at pretty good levels right now. And we're seeing a lot of LNG, liquefied natural gas plants being built because other countries need gas uh, because of ongoing world events. And so we're exporting a lot more gas than we have in the past. Uh, what we have seen is uh, scarcity occurs from time to time because we, we've done less drilling. And as that scarcity does occur, then we see gas prices go up. Uh, we, we saw an event earlier in the year where a uh, liquefied natural gas facility went offline to deal with some maintenance problems and we saw a pretty significant drop in natural gas prices uh, i'll tell you at, at this point we're seeing very very competitive natural gas pricing but it is a commodity and it will vary as a function of the production in the market but our country has very good gas reserves and we we produce enough for our, our needs plus we're exporting quite a lot and anticipate exporting more. Does, does that help? Yeah, Benny, I, I'll just add to you. I mean, you hit, you hit it on the head. Um, the long and short of it is it's the, it's the opposite, where we have enough for ourselves, but this summer, and specifically you're referencing the, the war in Europe and, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, a lot of our European allies um, were you know, receiving you know, Texas natural gas in the form of liquefied natural gas. And over the summer, we spoke to our community about how that was actually driving prices up here in Texas because of the supply constraints. And so it, it was interesting, Benny, you mentioned that there was a, an LNG terminal here in, in Texas that had to go down, which meant more gas stayed in Texas because it couldn't get out to Europe. And that actually increased the supply here in Texas, which helped lower gas for us. So it's interesting just being generally aware of kind of the, the global consequences of what's going on and, and how that impacts us here locally in, in San Antonio. Thanks, Corey. We have time for one more live question, and we are going to go to James. James, you are next online. I mean, not live to ask your question. My question is about uh, iron flow long storage batteries. I read that the city of Burbank had contracted with a firm to build a, a huge storage uh, facility that um, allows them to uh, store the energy produced from their wind and solar for a longer period of time 
uh, during times of uh, peak output uh, to be used at times when uh, that output drops. I'm wondering if uh, we have, as CPS has actually uh, looked into this uh, uh, cold uh, iron, iron flow uh, long storage battery uh, situation for our use here in Texas. So let me start with not specifically iron flow. Uh, I am aware that that is one variation of a flow battery that's in the market. Uh, it, it's coming into the market, really. And vanadium is another uh, type of flow battery. So and there's a couple more, I think, out there as yeah. well. We're, we're starting to look now. Uh, the, the technology is just pushing out into the market and uh, seeing commercial success. We, um, we, we want to protect ourselves from early mover uh, problems that we could experience with pilot projects that, that don't work. So we, we've tried to watch and uh, let some other folks get just a little ways ahead and make sure things are looking pretty good just as part of our risk management strategy. Uh, the, the last thing I want to do is have to report to the board that we invested millions of dollars and have a, have a technology that, that doesn't deliver for our community. Uh, but that said, we, we are seeing that flow batteries are starting to gain a footing. And uh, as I mentioned a little earlier on the call, I had a conversation with a, a company earlier this week, and we've got an opportunity to uh, do a, a project with them. And it looks like that there will be uh, grant funding that could be available to help us with that process. And we, we will certainly push those forward as they come up. So to answer your question, to loop back around, we haven't done it yet, but we are moving forward, uh, looking at the technologies. And if it's viable, we will certainly use it because we could benefit greatly from longer duration storage and uh, higher capacities to help us uh, be able to push energy across our peak. We we have extended peak periods. Thanks, Benny. And Angela, I want to turn to you really quick before we wrap up, um, just to make some closing remarks on our, our commitment uh, from an environmental standpoint. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Yes. So again, one of the important things that we're looking at as we're planning for our power generation and how we're going to you know, power your homes and your businesses into the future is how we can do that in an environmentally sustainable way and be resilient as um, we move into the future and providing you with reliable power. And so we'll continually look at options that help us reach those net zero targets by 2050 and the interim targets as well for 2030 and 2040 so that we can meet our commitment that we've made to our community to reduce emissions. Thank you, Angela. And I wanna thank my fellow CPS Energy team members who joined us tonight. And thank you for all for participating, whether it be on the phone or on Facebook or on live. And thank you for taking the time um, to, to join us. If you weren't, if we weren't able to get you to your question this evening, you can leave a voicemail after the event by simply staying on the call when we end and you will be transferred into our uh, voicemail system. Again, thanks for joining us, and please don't forget to take our survey that you can find at cpsenergy.com forward slash path forward, and good night, everyone.